So it is now my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Alan Ocross, our prominent keynote speaker. Dr. Ocross holds a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology from the University of Waterloo. He is a full professor in the Royal Military College Department of Defense Studies, Deputy Director Research in the Canadian Defense Academy, Dallaire Center of Excellence for Peace and Security, as well as Special Advisor to the Chief Professional Conduct and Culture. He served in the Canadian Armed Forces from 1971 to 2004. As a researcher on leadership, gender equality and diversity, he has contributed to Canadian and international projects to achieve equality objectives and enhance military operational effectiveness. As a policy entrepreneur, he has advocated for evolutions in military understandings and approaches to diversity and inclusion within the Canadian Armed Forces and internationally, including involving the military in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Bolivia, Singapore, and South Africa. He serves as the chair of the Inter-University Seminar on the Armed Forces and Society Canada. Dr. Ocross, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the warm welcome. Uh, my appreciation specifically to Sarah and Gracia for the opportunity to contribute to what I am, uh, know is going to be an outstanding two days. Uh, we've got an hour for my initial session here, and trust me, none of us want to hear me talking for 59 minutes. Uh, so I really want to encourage people to consider that this opening session to be uh, conversations, not a formal presentation. Uh, and in particular, for the other presenters that are going to follow, uh, I would encourage them to pop up and flag uh, comments or issues or ideas that they will be addressing in their particular presentation. Uh, I am not going to do a summary of presentations or comments with this. Uh, what I would like to do for this session is to put it in a larger, broader context and hopefully get us thinking about some of the questions that we may want to ask as we go through uh, the presentations that actually form the substance of the project. Next slide, if I can, please. So I've only got four. I've only got a couple of slides. Um, so, uh, but I do want to start with a follow up to Alex. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples. Um, this, in the Canadian context at the present time, is important. Um, Canadians are certainly aware of the recent revelations with regards to the uh, residential school system. Um, and I think it's important for two reasons in the Canadian context. The first is 95% of Canadians are immigrants or descendants of immigrants. Uh, and I think for the purposes of this workshop, I think that's important for us to be thinking about. Uh, there's other countries that are similar to the context that we have. The second part is we do have a legacy in Canada of settler colonialism and cultural superiority. Um, and the consequences of things like the residential school system and the formal processes and policies the Canadian government had with regards to the original peoples of Canada are still with us today. And one of the consequences of this is that in our institutions and our institutional structures, including in our armed forces, we have got issues internally and including the fact that we've got structural racism. So these are things we need to be thinking about and talking about. Uh, particularly uh, to extend from that, in the Canadian military context over the last year, um, there has been increased attention to a number of facets of professional conduct. Uh, sexual harassment is an issue, racism is an issue, hateful conduct is an issue. Um, and Canada is not alone. There certainly are other countries, uh, including representatives here that are participating, that are looking at similar issues as well. Um, and one of the consequences with that that was mentioned is I am now double-hatted. Uh, we've recently created a new uh, senior level headquarters responsibility of the Chief of Professional Conduct and Culture. Uh, and to a large extent, the role and the mandate of the Lieutenant General and the senior leaders that are going to be forming this organization uh, is very much to address many of the issues that you are putting forward in, you know, the con in the chapters that I think are going to come out in the conversations as we go through. Um, 
So that's my sort of introduction. Uh, the last part for introduction that I also wanted to do is provide a time zone appropriate welcome to everybody. Uh, I know that for some people it's early morning, some people it's morning, uh, afternoon and evening. So greetings to everybody uh, and I'm glad you're able to join in. Uh, so what I'd like to do uh, now is turn to the next slide if I can please. I'm going to talk to this one for a bit. Uh, I encourage people to put comments in the chat. Uh, and once I finished having some conversation on this particular one, I want to stop and open it up for a conversation, as I've mentioned. Uh, so as part of this, I think it's important for us to have some thinking and consideration about the, again, the intersections of government, armed forces and society. Most of the work that's being done in the chapters here really put the spotlight on the, the others, uh, these immigrants, non-citizens who are joining the military. Uh, but I encourage us to shift and put the spotlight in different directions. Uh, and particular in here, starting to shift and look at the military, at the armed forces. Um, I, the armed forces is an important part of many of countries. Um, and we kind of take it for granted that we know what the purpose of the military is, what the role of the military is, etc. Um, and there's literature certainly on civil control of the armed forces, um, but I'm not sure the extent to which we critically put the military per se under the research microscope to look at it, to challenge it, to think about uh, what the military is. So a few things that I wanted to start with. Uh, the first one is, and it was mentioned in the introductory comments as well, um, some of the issues around civil military relations. Um, and one of the key things is, why is it that we are interested in having anybody join the military, let alone why is it are we interested in having different types of people join the military. Uh, I think most of us are aware uh, there's a number of different rationales that are used and I would suggest these rationales differ across countries uh, and I think this is an important point for us to be talking about. Uh, there certainly is the philosophical, the moral uh, reasoning that says that the military should reflect the population that it's uh, there to defend. Um, there is an idea certainly in many nations that the government is there to serve all people therefore all people should be able to serve in government. Uh, so I think that there are some important moral philosophical uh, reasons uh, that justify that underpin the discussions that we have. In many countries, we also have got very strong legal reasons, certainly in the Canadian context, there's a range of law that requires the Canadian Armed Forces to take proactive measures to increase those who are in the military. Um, and, and again, particularly in the Canadian context, Alono and some other countries as well, um, part of the reason for current policies and practices is a result of legal actions. Uh, Canada is just in the process of settling a series of class action lawsuits um, as a result of legacies of discrimination that the Canadian Armed Forces is engaged in uh, against individuals based on a number of different identity factors. And on occasions, therefore, or the military gets pushed to doing things that it may not necessarily automatically have wanted to do. The other one which we commonly talk about are the instrumental and functional reasons. Uh, the recognition that in many countries like Canada, um, it's difficult to fill the recruiting roster, um, that if there is a real battle for talent in many countries, and if the military wants to attract the best and the brightest, it needs to be reaching out, connecting with all sectors of society to try to make sure that uh, individuals that have the skills, the knowledge, the talent, and the motivation uh, to join the military um, are interested in doing so. The other part that I think is important here under civil military relations is the degree to which the military is responsive to social changes. Uh, again, we've not had a lot of scholarship on describing the military as a profession or an institution, um, but uh, I go back to Huntington's good description about being realistic, pessimistic and conservative. Uh, and one of the consequences of that that we can see with the military is it is an institution that is reluctant to change. 
Uh, you can see strong elements in most militaries of a focus on a past that has to be preserved rather than talking about a future that is going to be constructed. Um, and again, I would suggest in many, many countries, we can see this playing out uh, with frustrations, with pressures uh, on the military to evolve faster than the military chooses to. Um, and one of the issues, again, back to the legal uh, suits that have happened in the Canadian context, uh, is a fundamental question about who gets to decide. Um, in the Canadian context, if we go back to the late 1980s, when the Canadian military uh, banned women from serving in combat occupations, uh, it went to a human rights tribunal. And the human rights tribunal recognized the debate and the balance between uh, ensuring military operational effectiveness versus what was discrimination against an important half the population. Uh, but what the Human Rights Tribunal said when they ordered the military to open up all combat occupations was it was not a choice the military got to make. Uh, and I think that that is an issue that comes up from time to time and is important to think about. I'll shift on to the civil control of the armed forces. Uh, and again, we've got lots of literature, uh, lots of good theory that explain what this is. Most of us as academics understand that in theory, theory explains practice. In practice, it doesn't always. Um, and I think it's important for us to look at the practice. Uh, to what extent is this really done? To what extent is the armed forces really subject to civil control uh, versus to what extent is there an internal philosophy of seeking to basically maintain a high degree of independence? Uh, this is important because this is what professions seek to do. All professions want to have independence and control to regulate their own professional practice. Uh, and so I think this is a tension that you can see playing out, uh, particularly when political masters want the military to do things uh, and the military quite honestly doesn't want to do it. Uh, it's not often that we get the outright revolts. We've had them in Canada, at unification, the revolt of the admirals, etc. cetera. Um, but one of the, my American colleagues uh, on occasion has referred to the fine art of bureaucratic shirking. Um, how does the military kind of sort of get along with what the government has told them to do, but in reality not do it? Um, I'll pick on my American colleagues for a little bit. Um, it's always fascinating to watch the Quadrennial Defense Review um, because the American military has a habit of pivoting from one focus to another. Um, and it's amazing that back in the good old days of the Cold War, uh, aircraft carriers were absolutely essential for the standoff against the Red Navy. Uh, but then when we did a pivot to terrorism, all of a sudden aircraft carriers were absolutely essential to deal with the global war on terror. Um, and of course, we do a pivot towards China. Aircraft carriers are suddenly really important for that. Uh, it's interesting how the things that the military think are important just continue to be what is of importance. Um, uh, and so it, it, I think it's important for us to be thinking about to what extent does the military really do this. Uh, and it also leads into sort of the narratives. Um, as people are probably aware, um, the in the UK context, uh, the Queen Elizabeth, uh, the new, their new aircraft carrier, uh, is out doing uh, a nice tour around, going to go visit all sorts of places. Uh, and it's an interesting thing to watch the narratives of to what degree are they showing up with lollipops and teddy bears to do random acts of kindness versus to what extent are they engaging in a so show of force. Um, so these things are important. They influence uh, the military, how it is seen, and they influence how the military fits into the government as a whole. Uh, so the last one with this one that I want to sort of talk to a little bit is, is these narratives and particularly what is the role and purpose of the military. Virtually all militaries have an internal narrative about who we are and what we're here to do. Most of the time it's wrapped around war fighting and those sorts of issues. Um, and there's some interesting narratives that come out about, uh, and if we're not actually engaged in war fighting, we probably need to be somewhat useful. So we'll take on these non war fighting things just as long as it doesn't sort of, co you know, o overlap or coincide with our war fighting responsibilities that we want to have. Um, but that isn't always what 
the nation is looking for. It isn't always the narrative that the government wants to construct. Um, so I think it's interesting for us to think about uh, those issues. It leads into these broader roles and purpose of the military. Uh, and I'll ask a couple of questions. You know, to what extent is the primary role of the military to generate better citizens? Uh, some of the research that's in some of the chapters here, I think, talks to that. Um, it's not an issue that always comes up in other countries, though. Uh, to what extent is the role of the military to serve in constructing the shared narrative of the nation? Uh, again, some militaries engage in this and some military leaders are aware of it, uh, but not all. Some don't really get into it or think about it. Uh, the last bit that I'll talk to is this issue of immigrants. Uh, and I'll talk to the Canadian context in particular. Uh, roughly 22% of Canadians, uh, 8 million people, uh, are deemed to be, uh, to be immigrants, first generation citizens. Uh, and many of them hold dual citizenship. Um, so we've got over 7 million Canadians uh, that hold dual citizenship. Uh, and we have seen this in the Canadian context. Uh, when there has been conflict in other nations, we suddenly have a bunch of people with Canadian passports who head home to go and defend the homeland. Um, and I think those are important things to think about. What does this mean in terms of people's identity, in terms of people's loyalty? Uh, the other thing that I think with this as well is we do tend to have this interest in looking at uh, why people join, um, how, you know, how they experience military service. I don't know whether we always think about how does the military experience others? Um, how does the rest of the institution respond to uh, these individuals that are coming in? Uh, this is an important thing in the Canadian context right now under some of the diversity policies where the military is saying that it wants to value the differences, the difference in, in world views and experiences that people bring. Um, but at the same time, the military puts them through the intentional socialization machine um, and tries to make them like everybody else. So I've been on high speed burst for a bunch of time on a number of topics here. So what I'd like to do is stop at this stage, uh, open things up for questions, comments, responses to chat, um, and have people engage in the conversation. We had a very interesting comment in chat from uh, Joanne Saint Chagrin, who was linking diversity within the military to the diversity of the populations that armed forces meet in missions, uh, and that this link is very important to one reinforces the other. Uh, how important do you think that is, Dr. Okros? I think I think it's extremely important. Um, I think there's there's many facets here that uh, the military needs to be thinking about, and this is where I'm trying to put an emphasis on you know what the institution as a whole. Uh, needs to do, how it understands itself, how it engages with different communities, how it engages with different peoples. Um, militaries tend to be fairly monolithic in this area um, and they have difficulty in being able to, uh, be, you know, basically show cultural awareness, cultural knowledge, be adaptive. Um, and, I, and I'll link into a couple of others in terms of, you know, one of the core issues with this one is, you know, building trust with the citizens. Um, again, some research in the Canadian context, particularly looking at uh, young members of the Islamic communities, have indicated that they would be quite interested in joining the Canadian Armed Forces if they had uh, an opportunity to choose what kind of missions they went on internationally. Um, we've had similar things coming from uh, in research has been looking at uh, Indigenous uh, Canadians and their interest in joining the military. Uh, do we give people a cultural conscientious objector card that says I'm not prepared to deploy on that mission in that country uh, because it violates uh, fundamental principles about who I am and what my values are. Um, that's a real challenge to the military with the emphasis on obedience to authority, et cetera. Um, but these, I think, are some of the things that the, that the military needs to think about. Um, I know, and we do have presenters and commentators, uh, but I think uh, internal within the Israeli Defense Force, I know there's been important discussions and conversations that have gone on on some of these issues of recognizing differences in terms of people willing to serve, but also in terms of 
what kind of missions and roles they're willing to fulfill. Uh, and it also goes into the issue in terms of what kind of values and principles do people put in bear, bring to bear when they make independent moral judgments about their own actions. Uh, when does have somebody have the right to stand up and say to the boss, my moral compass is pointing in a different direction. I cannot agree with that. So I think there's important issues there that we need to be thinking about and talking about. Uh, Aldun Albino, you have a question. Please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you so very much. What a fascinating uh, uh, thing to be at. Uh, doctor, uh, I am a serving member of the Canadian Forces almost 40 years now and uh, I've enjoyed my time. I can answer to some of the reasons why I joined, which was I believed I owed uh, this great country of ours uh, um, uh, something back for what this has given me. Uh, as for diversity, I just came off an ALP course, Advanced Leadership Program, uh, discussing the, uh, what we should be doing in the forces. And I think you mentioned their goal, but they're not doing it. I can speak for myself. I can guarantee you we're not achieving those trying to be diverse. Uh, my particular topic when I wrote my paper was on what I'm now calling the LD community or Learning Differently community. Uh, the Canadian Forces is now addressing that. And there's a major problem with inside the community, uh, as I am just found that I'm dyslexic, uh, of not being accepted because of behavioral patterns with inside that community, i.e., uh, I am looking at somebody, which is also patterns for different cultures. Uh, natives, uh, uh, also uh, Asian communities don't look people direct, uh, direct gazing. There's also an issue with inside um, the community of the LDC community, which nobody has been addressing. Uh, I'm working on that right now to help that come through, but I can tell you for myself, I've been told because of direct gazing, which affects different cultures, as I said, the Asian community, the Native community, the Black community, I was told because I don't direct gaze, I'm not acceptable. I will not be promoted. And I can tell you right now, that's been happening to me because of this sort of issue. Is that, is there any thought as to the LDC community? Because right now I'm pushing that in the, uh, in the CAF because nobody seems to know about it. On my course, when I mentioned the struggles we had as dyslexics, everyone was shocked that we even existed in the Canadian forces. And I said, we're probably 20, 30 percent, like the outside world. Um, has any of these topics come up during your, your discussions? I know it, it's the indigenous people. I know it's the, everybody else. And I know they're struggling, especially women, even still today, which I cannot understand. But this, to me, becomes, as I call them, the invisible uh, community. Uh, is there some way we can push that forward? Um, before we move on, uh, Randy Wakeham also has a question. Maybe we can take both of them together. Randy, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Um, thanks for your comments, Al. Uh, they've stimulated my a few gray cells, uh, as always. Um, <laughs> just by way of background, uh, most people don't know me. Um, I spent the first half of my military career uh, flying for the Army, um, sort of in the Air Force and the last half working at the Staff College in Toronto and then subsequently teaching at RMC. Um, and I guess Al brings up a good point and it's very much reinforced by Alderman's comments on what is it that, that the simple operator and regardless of what job they do is looking for in their uh, peers, their superiors, their subordinates. And I think they're looking for someone that they can trust to do the job more or less as it needs to be done. And for a lot of people, diversity, learning disabilities, and I've had a couple of students uh, at RMC who had uh, um, diagnosed LD, and they were brilliant. They were brilliant scholars. They, they learned better than the average student. Um, but, oh my God, as Alden says, uh, on paper, there's something different about them. Um, I've, you know, there are, um, <clears throat> so how do we, accept the fact that there are different people with different backgrounds from different cultures or different, uh, just different and from the norm and what is the norm? So, uh, cause that's what I'm looking for as an operator. I'm looking for someone that seems to be able to do the job as I describe it, as I see it. Um, but I'm perfectly willing to sit down and say, right. Okay. You don't think the way I do, uh, uh cognitively, uh, you don't have the same uh, cultural practices as, uh, as I do, but that's okay. And and I think there's the tension trying to, to find the sweet spot, the sweet space where both of those things can work uh, in relative harmony. Um, and 
many of the old white men like me, I think, have difficulty accepting that someone who doesn't look or doesn't think like them can operate like them. So I'll just stop there. It's more of an observation than a question, but maybe it's, it's uh, as I say, it's, I, I just thought it was worth sharing. I'll, I'll provide a couple of comments, but I would encourage others to join in and, and Grace in particular, you may want to, to speak to the issues of learning differences uh, because uh, I think it is an important topic. Uh, the first thing that I'll go to is I'll extend Randy on your comment about just doing the job. That's what's important is doing the job. But in the military, we have a real strong tendency to add and it's doing the job and it's doing it the way we want it done. Um, and that I think becomes the real problem. Um, and I go back to sort of my comments about, you know, the military and the past to be preserved. Uh, again, we've got the sort of narrative of uh, the lessons paid within blood over the centuries, we will never forget them. And they become a real barrier to the military thinking about or imagining any other way of doing it than the way it's always being done. Uh, and so I think that's really is the important part is the degree to which we impose on people a certain set way of this is the way you must perform this. This is how you do the job. Uh, this becomes really important with leadership. Uh, again, you know, we've had lots of people from different backgrounds that have joined the military uh, and I've had the conversations with them. There's research that talks about it of you know, to a large extent, them saying this isn't the way that I would necessarily lead people, but this is what the military wants to see. So I've learned how to yell, swear, kick ass, take names, interrupt. I've learned this aggressive dynamic leadership model because that's the only way of doing leadership that the military is willing to recognize. Um, and, and this I think is a significant challenge. Uh, there are people that are recognizing that there's alternate ways of leading. Uh, you can be, you can take different approaches. You can support and enable people rather than always directing people. Um, and again, in the Canadian context, Text. We've got research that's being done. Uh, senior officers believe they are engaging in transformational leadership. I'm growing, I'm guiding, uh, I believe in you know command philosophy and I delegate authority. Uh, the research from junior non-commissioned members shows it's very much transactional, my way or the highway, I'm in charge, do it the way I tell you to do it. Um, and uh, so, you know, these are the conversations and discussions uh, that need to be held, you know, had within the military. Uh, I think we've got, there's real pressures and challenges. Uh, one of the other stats that I would point out uh, in two years ago, undergraduate university students in Canada, um, we had over 40% of them identified as visible minorities. We know that 60% of them are women. We have another 10% who are members of the LGBT communities. Um, and that's before we get into those that who are you know, have learning differences. Uh, so the straight, straight English speaking white men right now are 24% of the undergraduate university population in Canada. Um, the Canadian Armed Forces cannot continue over recruiting from that shrinking pool. Um, and it's not just about, again, this is part of what a lot of the research gets us into. It's not just about convincing these others to join us. It's changing the us that they are going to join into. Uh, I think that's where Aldwin got us started thinking about this. Um, and there are many others who unfortunately um, are, have been given these signals and these messages of we are not going to be able to promote you because you don't perform leadership the way that we expect you to. Uh, uh, so yes, I, I think there's significant challenges. Uh, and that's why I wanted to turn the spotlight on the military, on the institution, on the profession, rather than keeping the spotlight on how do we help these others become like us? Um, how do we change the us so that it fully embraces and benefits from these differences that people bring? Grace, I'm not sure if you wanted to have a comment on learning and learning differences. Thank you, Al, for an engaging uh, keynote. As usual, uh, you've started us thinking in all sorts of different directions. So Al is an expert at that. Uh, so be before we talk about the learning differences, I just want to uh, sort of reinforce what you just said that, uh, you know, up until now, and hoping this is going to change, it was more for underrepresented groups to, who are coming into the military 
to adapt to the institution. But now we are looking at how is the institution, how does it need to change so that it is adaptive, it is uh, open uh, and flexible for all sorts of different people from all sorts of different backgrounds, different leadership styles and different genders and gender preferences and different ethnicities. So, I, I, and cultures, obviously. Uh, so, I, you know, I think that is changing. And uh, I think that in Canada, we have, I guess, the momentum of a lot, a lot of uh, sort of class actions and all sorts of complaints against the military to enact all this social change that I'll just mm -hmm. mention. In terms of learning disabilities, I think that up until now, um, so I have a good friend who was a major in the Air Force with a learning disability, he never even mentioned it in his whole career in the military for fear that he would not move forward in his career. Um, he is an extremely smart man. Uh, he has an engineering background and he's a you know, good family friend, uh, him and his wife. But I just could not believe that in his whole career, he never even mentioned it. Uh, obviously things are changing. So for example, uh, you know, not uh, too long ago, but quite recently at the Royal Military College of Canada, they started with policies to accommodate uh, learning disabilities that have a little sort of a, a hub, if you will, uh, to accommodate students writing exams and what have you. Uh, it's, a, it's a just scratching the surface, right? Because that's just about this specific institution where I am today, wonderful campus in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, but, you know, at the institutional level, I, I really don't know how to be 100% honest, what is being done at the institutional level in terms of when we are recruiting uh, um, or when we are accommodating members that are already in the forces who have learning disabilities. But as Randy Wakeland just mentioned, uh, people with learning disabilities are also extremely, extremely talented in many other areas, but they have some difficulties in others, right? So uh, that's my little rant. Sarah, you wanted to add something. No, actually, uh, I know we've got a couple of other hands up. So, um, sorry, are you going to Alvin? Um, Sarah had, was first, okay. uh, she had something to say. Go ahead, Sarah. Sure. Thank you. If I can kind of springboard off of the, the last remarks that Grace had mentioned, I'm just wondering, um, it's I guess more of a question that I'm posing, but how do we kind of spotlight each individual's unique identities and assets, but balance that with those individuals becoming mm -hmm. othered within the armed forces? And I think that this is something that uh, is, uh, is brought up by Dr. Pendlebury in his chapter on Australia in terms of um, the data that's being collected or the way that, uh, that members in the Australian Defense Force are, are, are othered and categorized. So I think it kind of raises an, an interesting point in terms of a balancing act where we can appreciate each individual and their unique identities and assets, but at the same time, uh, be cognizant of, of not othering individuals as well. So. Uh, commenty kind of question, but thanks. And Alvin, you wanted to say something to this point? I, I loved uh, everything that was brought up, uh, especially about the the uh, intelligence. Uh, I can speak for myself, I've got 142 IQ. I'm terrified to let my command team know. I, in my paper, I wrote that over 50% of NASA are dyslexics. You know, but they were brilliant people. I don't think there's any limitation to them, but the acceptance in the forces were not being accepted. If my command team knows that, I am done. They will not accept me. I will lose my job. And, and, and I know that. Right now, I'm working on a, a way to help these people come out so that they won't have this issue. But you know, I'm not sure I'm gonna, it's going to help them or not. And, I, and, and listening to you guys talk, maybe we can find a way to help these people, help, our, help this community. Okay, if I could, um, I'll answer one of the questions that's in the chat and then uh, this conversation is actually leading to the next portion of comments that I wanted to have. So there, there is a question with regards to conflating leadership and management. Uh, and one of the comments that I'll make with that one to recognize is uh, a challenge with most militaries is they seek to function as a profession, but they are bounded by government 
and government operates as a bureaucracy. Um, uh, and one of the challenges we have in the Canadian context, and I would say several out of the countries, uh, we've also got governments that are trying to adopt free market uh, private sector practices to have efficiencies. So we actually have three different models. Uh, it's Elliot Friedson's professionalism, the third logic that want to know about the three models, uh, but all three of professionalism, bureaucracy and the market ideology are in are at play. And so one of the consequences of that is in the military, I would suggest at the small unit, small team, you can see a real emphasis on leadership. It is on motivating, it is on building the team, it is paying attention to individuals. But as you move up in the organization, see more senior people end up encountering the bureaucracy and have to get engaged in management and management practices. Um, and it's not an easy fit. Um, the vast majority of leaders in the Canadian military bristle if you call them managers because they do not see their role that way. Um, uh, but they, they need to actually be adept in both. Uh, so I'll just stop there if I can and I'll ask if we can go to the next slide. As uh, I think a number of things that we've been talking about here uh, are these issues around uh, professionalism, professional practices, um, you know, and and so part that I want to point out with this is it's it's into these deeper issues about what the military does and how it does it. So one of the key things that we recognize with this is the military engages in intentional professional socialization. The, the military will take the civilian and convert them into the soldier, sailor, aviator, leader, commander. Um, and it's really fascinating watching the military do it. Uh, uh, people in uniform, particularly when they're you know working at recruit schools or entry level schools or etc., um, they know how to go about doing it. But I would offer very few of them really consciously think about it. Uh, and so, of course, the first thing to recognize is this is the process of social construction. Uh, and so we are engaging in constructing the prototype ideal. Uh, and this is where I think a lot of these frust you know, these concerns come in. We model for people, this is what the ideal, again, soldier, sailor, aviator, leader looks like. Uh, and for some people, they look at it, they can relate to it, they can say, yep, yeah, uh, that's me, um, so I can see that. Uh, but others can't, they, they don't fit into it. Uh, and this is where we get into the issue of liminal states, people that aren't sure about what's expected of me, who am I going to be? Um, we don't always think about rites of passage. Um, you know, how do we actually transform people? Uh, again, at the Canadian example, at the Royal Military College, uh, they do the first year orientation program and they put you know brand new cadets through a whole bunch of stuff. They assume they're internalizing a set of values, a worldview. Uh, but nobody actually goes to check to see what it actually is. Um, so I think we need to think about these it, these processes of professional socialization and how people experience them, what comes out as a result of it. Uh, this leads to these ideas of identities. So while we are presenting to people what the prototype ideal soldier looks like, they're also bringing their own personal identity with it. Uh, and so we end up with this idea of braided identities. Um, I can filter in this part of being soldier, but I'm also bringing in this part of being who I am, my community, my background, etc. cetera. Um, and we need to recognize there's multiple facets of identity. So the Canadian Armed Forces is getting a little bit better at applying intersectional analysis, recognizing multiple facets of identity and that these are of importance. But one of the things, of course, that happens through this professional socialization is we are imposing a preferred identity on people. And if they're going to fit in and if they're going to be successful, it actually means for some people they have to give up part of who they are in order to be successful. Uh, and so one of the questions is, you know, with what moral authority does the military do that? With what moral authority does the military force the individual to have to actually give up parts of who they are in order to be successful? Um, and that goes to the other one that we talked about a little bit as well. You know, we emphasize a lot the obligations of the individual in uniform, um, unlimited liability, obedience to authority. You know, these things are all emphasized. This is what you have to give to the institution. 
well, what are the obligations of the institution to the individual in uniform? Um, again, one of the famous phrases, we're here to protect democracy, not practice it. Uh, well, the military actually has to practice democratic principles um, and actually has to recognize if you're going to impose restrictions on the rights and privileges that the average citizen enjoys, then the institution that limits those rights and freedoms has an increased obligation to actually look after the people and pay attention to the harm or damage that it can do. This is why these current class action lawsuits and why the current political attention, again, not only in Canada, um, and we've had it with the Wigston report in the UK, the Brereton report in Australia, SecDef in the US has commissioned major research on this right now. Uh, there's a lot of these questions about what the military does to the people who join, uh, under what conditions, uh, what rights do people have, how do they get to speak up? So I'll stop with that short burst and open it up again for the conversation to continue. Dr. Sadman had an interesting comment in chat that professionalism has taken us in some wrong directions. I don't know if he's listening to us, if Dr. Sadman, you want to elaborate on that or whether uh, Dr. Okros, you want to answer right away. Steve, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, uh, I think it, one of the, when you were talking about shirking, uh, the thing that came to mind for me was uh, the Canadian Armed Forces not implementing the Deschamps report, all right? And so that was clearly a priority of the civilians. Uh, and then for some reason, we really didn't get very far in it. And, uh, and I think part of the, and, and at least on the, I don't know if what Jody Thomas said was true, but on the, our Battle of the Podcast, she basically said, well, we were trying to work with Vance on it. And he told us to shut up. Um, and that goes to sort of the problems with professionalism, that professionalism tells you that you are the expert uh, and nobody else is, and nobody else really has a role in overseeing you, that you should have complete autonomy to handle your expertise, which is the management of violence and everything that is associated with it. And as a result, you stay out of politics, sort of, uh, but what it means is then when you get told things by the civilians, you can say, well, you don't really know what you're talking about. Uh, we'll stick to what we know best. And so I, I just wanted to raise the, the issue that the, the challenge of, of people still reading and living Sam Huntington's book, uh, <laughs> it, uh, you know, he's done a lot of damage with his other books, but I think, <laughs> I think the, 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 the book on, uh, on, on, the, on civil mill relations has, is, has got to be replaced because I think we've had enough evidence over the past 20 years that the starting assumption that professionals will salute and do the job as ordered uh, is less credible than uh, sort of the principal agent alternative, which is the starting assumption is individual officers and collections of officers will believe, you know, that they will do what they think is best, whether that's more or less or different from what the civilians asked for. And shirking can be doing less, it can be doing more, um, it could be doing differently. Uh, and we've seen that, uh, you know, the, the past six months of this is, this has been essentially one of the consistent threads of, of our, uh, personnel crisis, uh, our abuse of power crisis that we have in the Canadian Armed Forces. If they were all professionals, we wouldn't have an abuse of power problem. Every, you know, everybody would be treated in equal, as an equal professional. And then we wouldn't have, you know, vice chief defense staff golfing with, uh, you know, people who are under investigation. So a couple of comments, um, and, and I fully agree uh, with, with Steve's comments. Um, the first one, of course, is that, you know, I'm the fan that Morris Janowitz was right and Sam Huntington was wrong. And I still, for those that ha haven't read Morris's work, and of course, it's the origin of the international, of the Inter-University Seminar in Armed Forces Society. <laughs> so we, we, we keep Morris's flag flying. Uh, although, again, his is now, you know, close to 60 years out of date as well. So we do need to update some of this. But I'll go specifically to Deschamps because it's an illustration of some of these issues of professional practice uh, and these issues that we don't look at. So for those that aren't aware, the core of the recommendations that were not implemented had to do with independent external oversight and authorities. 
And the problem with that is it challenges the power of the chain of command. Um, and it's not just an ego issue of I'm the CEO and nobody can tell me what to do. What's at the core underlying this, the third rail that the military gets concerned about is if we do not have the ability to exercise discipline, and I'll point out justice is the punishment appointed to award it to the guilty party. Discipline is the message sent to everybody else. Um, so if we can't engage with discipline then we can't generate the combat effectiveness that we believe is absolutely essential to our core mission. So you've got these narratives that are constructed. Uh, Nancy Tabor several years ago did a really good article on our duty with honor manual uh, referring to ideological codes and boss texts. These are narratives you can't argue with, but they serve to justify the status quo. They serve to justify why power and privilege are distributed the way they are internally within the military. Um, and in the Canadian Armed Forces context, we're just starting to come to have that conversation and that discussion. Um, so I think it's an important thing for us to be thinking about, but part of it needs to start with what is it that the military holds dear? What is it that they think that is absolutely essential? I've made comments in other fora about, again, uh, normative conformity, obedience to authority, group loyalty. Uh, these are absolutely essential to create cohesive tight teams that are going to fight together, but they also create the conditions in which some people feel an ability to use social power to marginalize others, to discriminate against others, to call them out, to be der you know derogatory. Um, these are the double-edged swords and the military's not been willing to challenge these core tenants uh, because they can't imagine any other way of doing business than what they've always been doing. Um, again, last one that I'll throw out with this one is I keep going back to why does the chief of defense staff come down to watch us graduating the most promising great future leaders uh, and watching them do 18th century foot drill to 19th century martial music? Like why does the CDS not come down and hear the top honors thesis presentations of the bright ideas? Uh, this is all part of symbolism about what does the military consider to be important? Um, and so that's part that I'm trying to get us to think about. Um, so I will uh, I will shift and I'll go if I can to the, the third sort of topic that I wanted to do, uh, because in addition to challenging the military, I want to challenge us. I want to challenge those of us that are here who are researchers um, uh, and the kind of research that we do uh, and the kind of assumptions that go into it. Uh, so if you can go back to the yeah, back to the, the slides and the next one, please. Um, uh, so one of the issues with the way in which we are conducting our research, um, we as researchers have a huge host of take it for granted assumptions. I think most of us recognize there is no such thing as objective research, right? All researchers have positionality. Uh, so one of the questions is when we're conducting research and particularly those that are internal within the military doing research, to what extent are we contributing to myth-making? To what extent are we upholding these constructions of what the military intends to be? Uh, these idealized types, these personas, um, to, you know, so I think that's important for us to think about it. And one of the challenges that we have, again, I'll say in the Canadian military, but most others, we continue to have senior leaders who take decisions to preserve the myth rather than confronting the realities that exist. And I think we have to question ourselves when we're doing research about are we challenging senior leaders on the myth making. Uh, the second part is the assumption of scientific rationalism. Uh, my training is in IO psychology. There's others that are psychologists that are tuning in. We're great at going out and doing the survey and torturing the data until it confesses uh, and uh, con thinking to ourselves, we've come to ground truth. Um, there is no such thing as ground truth. There's many truths. There's many ways of understanding these things. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about challenging ourselves. Uh, we've talked about this, but these frameworks, to what extent do we continue to focus on this alien other that needs to be studied and understood? You know, women in the military, visible minorities in the military, indigenous peoples in the military, you know, rather than what I'm calling for is look at the institution, 
Um, right. Uh, the other part with this is the ethic versus emic. To what extent are we coming in and imposing the categories that we've constructed on individuals, as opposed to paying attention to the categories that they construct amongst themselves? Um, Anne Irwin, uh, a good colleague of mine, did great research uh, with uh, infantry company in Afghanistan, um, and she went in and looked at: Do soldiers differentiate themselves on based on whether they're male or female, gay or straight? you know, uh, whether they're visible minority or white, that wasn't at all how soldiers differentiated themselves, right? The way they differentiated themselves is who are the hard workers versus who are the slackers? Um, who are the social joiners versus the social loners? Um, who are the people when they got the goodies from home, hoarded them to themselves versus shared them out with others? Um, they paid attention to who were the country kids versus the city kids, because in Afghanistan, the country kids became really important. Um, like, so this is stuff that I think we need to encourage ourselves to do. We need to be cautious about constructing categories, imposing them on other people, and then doing research on those categorizations. Uh, and that leads to the last one of these issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, you know, I think again in, in several countries, we're now looking at this and we're looking at it from academic disciplines. Um, whose perspectives have been privileged in our disciplines? Whose voices and views have been ignored, have been marginalized? Um, I could pick on multiple disciplines, uh, but yeah, again, I can pick on psychology, um, you know, but political science, a whole bunch of assumptions in IR, you know, Know, that the state is neutral, the state doesn't have attitudes or opinions, the state doesn't reflect cultural perspectives. Um, so I think we need to think about whose perspectives are being privileged in here in the research we're doing, because we are amplifying certain voices and we're marginalizing others. Um, and again, I think particularly as the conversations go over the rest of today and tomorrow, in the international context, we tend to have a tendency to emphasize the commonalities. Uh, I mean, the five ice countries can all get together on the fact that we all mangle the English language in different ways. Um, you know, but we always start to seek the things that we have in common. I don't think we spend enough time looking at the differences. Um, uh, one of the most positive things we can do, and I encourage you through these conversations today and tomorrow, help me understand, help me understand how and why it's different in Brazil and it's different in India and it's different in Australia. Instead of looking for the, ah, I can see something that's similar to where I live. Um, because I think if we focus more on differences, we're going to actually surface some greater information and knowledge and understanding. So I will stop with that bit of my last high speed burst uh, and get us back to conversations, discussions, um, and I encourage others to join in on not only posing the questions, but also responding to some of the questions, because I'm certainly not the only one with views or opinions on these. Steve, do you want to amplify a little bit more with uh, what you and Philly Gasse are working on? Uh, sure. Um, I was just joking because you're talking about differences. I, I've been involved yeah. in a 15 country study. Uh, the goal of the summer is to finish the book, uh, comparing the role of legislatures and overseeing their militaries. Uh, and uh, and so we, we do find similarities and big differences amongst countries. And so when you were talking about Brazil, I was like, oh, I've been to Brazil. <laughs> it's a pretty different place. Uh, so uh, I think one of the I, th I think there's gonna be a lot more of that kind of work in the future because I think we spent too much time studying individual countries uh, and not enough doing comparative work. So one of the key findings we we found is that people tend to start with American models of of legislative oversight, and it turns out the American Congress is really exceptional. Uh, and actually, the how wonderfully lame the Canadian Parliament is is actually more typical of many countries, including countries we wouldn't expect. Uh, so uh, that's all forthcoming. We're, we're trying to beat this thing into, into shape, uh, you know, uh, this summer. But so that's my advertisement for a book that's coming out in a year or two.